so we talked about iconic and uh, and and uh, connected, but let's just think about how a skyline is created. Most skylines are created over time, but some are created at once, relatively speaking. Uh, through the reading of these skylines of the cities, we can understand what's going on historically, what's going on globally and locally in politics, economy, some of which, Giorgio, you touched on. Um, including pl price of real estate, price of construction, uh, innovation of the time. Um, but perhaps this is more difficult to read in newly made cities, cities that are built from a master plan in uh, a blank, sla blank slate site, so to speak, if we can call any site that. So how can we address iconicity and connectivity in such a state? where it is really built almost at once, the city. Um, and, and, and how do buildings become distinguished as iconic or not? And how do build buildings, whatever their scale may be, be thought of as connected or not? Uh, look, I'll take that one. Yep. Um, look, I, I, as Ian and I spoke about, I think purely, purely um, iconic buildings are buildings that over time have proven themselves. Um, they're the ones that we remember for specific reasons, and they're all individual reasons. Um, creating a city from scratch, you, you probably shouldn't start off trying to create an icon, although that's what every client asks us to do. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's, it's part of that. The, the thing you do get from being able to have uh, a city plan together is that you do actually get better opportunities to connect with each of the buildings, which uh, the, two, to the two presentations that we showed, the two buildings that we showed, um, were kind of buildings in isolation. Um, most of the buildings that do have connectivity above the ground plane um, are buildings that are built together or built as sort of precincts. Now, um, and that's actually connecting into things, connecting into um, services in one building that aren't um, applicable in, a, in another building. You don't have to go down the ground to come back up and, and, and those sorts of things. So, look, uh, in, in terms of designing an iconic skyline, I don't think that's something that any of us should actually be actually setting out to achieve because it's not the fundamental aspect of, I think, what we fundamentally want to do. Um, we should actually be trying to design buildings that actually work well for the communities and are loved for the communities, not just the building community, but also the larger community and the precinct-wide community. Um, and then they become iconic. Um, I had an old architectural mentor who used to tell me that any city's only got room for really um, two, at the most, sometimes three icons. Um, and I think, again, the, the term iconic has been somewhat uh, either eroded or perverted um, in recent decades. Um, and really, I think there's something to be said. Like, most of the, the cities that I really love are the ones that are slightly messy and slightly clunky. Mm -hmm. And the planned cities are usually the ones that are really interesting, but in a, in a, a way that you wouldn't want to live there. Uh, and I'm not talking about Canberra. <laughs> um, so there's, and from this morning's um, talk uh, about workplace, I th there was a, um, a, a term that I really liked, which was um, planned awkwardness mm. or, or something like that. And so there's, there's this idea that um, everything's just slightly clunky, not enough to actually change, but just enough to, I've just got to go around that corner, I've got to, got to you know, it's not easy. Everything's not just straight down that huge boulevard to get to the next place. And I think that mix of just slightly awkwardness um, is what makes a, um, a place a lot better than someone's just drawn it and, and you know, a pure planned space. Right, but when you do have a project which, you know, your client asks you to draw a master plan, how do you plan the awkwardness? Um, we, we have been designing um, a small town uh, just north of Melbourne recently and uh, we started out with the grid and then we started to look at the, the reasons why someone wouldn't just lay down a grid on the site. So we started to look at the high points, the low points and how those points would then start to manipulate the grid and to bend it. Um, uh, one of the, the guys in our office in Sydney, he talked about how in Amsterdam where he grew up that the, the bridges are places where people stop 
because they're all slightly ramped to a high point in the middle of the bridge. And it's a natural point where it's not exactly tiring to cycle up that bridge, but you kind of want to stop and, and pause, and people pause at these points, and then they talk and they share. Um, so we started to think about how that might work at a, a townscape level, and so that these grids start to bend to, instead of just passing halfway across the side of the hill, it would bend and meet at the top of the hill, so that you have these points. And then if that is a point where someone wants to, to stop and, and rest and maybe have a coffee, then that's a natural place to have a plaza. So that it, it's, you start to think about um, these sorts of uh, ideas that are almost naturally evolving out of the site. And then that sets up where a building might sit, and that sets up where certain view lines and vistas might start to work to reinforce those ideas. This is a very difficult question. It's the question is, how do you make a good city? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question. <laughs> Well, I'm, I think Melbourne is a fast city, okay? So relatively speaking, now we have some history in the city, but I'm Italian, and I can say that's a very fast city. Um, you know, the, the beauty of cities is very often that layering of different, uh, in time, that creates that awkwardness, the, the unpredictable. Uh, it's the Roman castrum that, as that in time, becomes a medieval center, and it keeps growing. So a good city, perhaps, is one that can grow. And Melbourne demonstrated that. Melbourne is a good city. And it has a grid, but it has the laneways, which were an afterthought. They didn't quite were planned, but they, they, there's some orography. There's the top ends, which is where the first towers were built, in fact, as a river. Um, and so in time, it has layered and has become uh, interesting. And the CBD, in particular, has that because, in a sense, it looks to me, New York is another example of, in a way, the, the, the less you do sometimes, then the more something will happen. When if we over design it, someone say Canberra, I don't mind Canberra too much, frankly, but, but that, that's probably an example. No, I don't. I'm, <laughs> I'm a Melbourneian, so I don't. But I'm saying that perhaps we should not over design them and just have to take into account the time factor that, that will hopefully fix it, so to speak, um, in time. But it's, a, it's an open question, uh, and it depends on culture. Would we do this in China today or in, in uh, South America? Or it has to respond to the cultures, too. Yeah, look, I think uh, from an aeronautical point of view, I think uh, as far as how we can potentially fit into this iconic sort of label you give it, it's probably, um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the approaches into the old Hong Kong airport where the aircraft could basically see what everyone was watching on TV in the apartment blocks flying in. That's probably not the right idea of associating something iconic with an airport. But uh, I guess what I can say is, you know, with anything starting from scratch, um, the more that the land use planning can be taken into consideration with respect to the airport can obviously facilitate a lot more growth in the future so that you're not face with these sort of limitations going forward as the city develops further. So we, uh, as an aside, we talked earlier in some other session um, about a lot of automation, um, not AI purely, but um, a lot of automation of tasks that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, analyzing things. Do you think, I mean, that there's an app in there that could plug in operational issues and time frames uh, with the, the, the prescribed envelope of the buildings? Look, it's, it um, is possible. Um, it, it would still be quite limiting in terms of its interpretation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still going to, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is, could you have some sort of app that tells you how tall you could build here and you could just jump on and figure it out and know whether or not something taller or shorter would be okay? Well, no, uh, more than that, because the issue that you bring up is, is an operational one. You know, usually we'll, we're told your building can be 180 meters, and you bet that the parapet's going to be at 180 meters. But what about the crane, right? Yeah, right. Well, um, yeah, look, I think... So it's uh, time frames that where, where things start to... Sure. Well, I mean, the, the, yeah, the, with that example, I mean, the, the extent, the more the the total impact of the development can be factored in, whether or not that's by virtue of an app or not. I, I, I haven't really thought about that personally, but um, 
yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take that away and consider it. Okay. Um, and uh, Giorgio, maybe also going back to something you mentioned earlier, uh, and that was discussed at the plenary session. Um, do you think about these buildings that now are our heritage, which were speculative buildings, some of them, right? Maybe not so special. Um, do you think there's a possibility of archeologically sensitive hacking in a way? Archeologically sensitive hacking? Yeah, so you, you talk mean? about um, there's embedded value in some of these buildings that we perhaps don't take our time to discover. At the same time, yes. there's other needs that we need to respond to well, now. That's right. I mean, there's certainly some value that we, we might want to discover, um, perhaps academically sometimes, because like, things like construction, innovation, just looking back, even if we don't have the buildings yet, we can learn. Mm -hmm. um, but there is certainly a lot of opportunities about reuse. Um, the, the question is, how do we reuse them? And when we do so, how do we draw the line between the things that we, we can freely uh, convert to new use versus respect archaeologically sometimes what they represented because in a sense um, the, the value of the cities is often in the layering on different time periods and now we come into that particular period of time where we don't understand it because it was just yesterday mm -hmm. but it's about time to think about that that's usually what happens in heritage you know. You showed, Georgia, a um, photograph, an image of serious building. As you know, perhaps, uh, is the news from last week, that the New South Wales Heritage Minister decided not to list uh, the series. Uh, even if a large group from the Institute of Architects, from our urban uh, task, or um, SPAUDI, for example, is a, a small group of architect urban designers, we uh, decided to make some kind of comments about this building. So it's something to say that us as academics or Institute of Architects don't have the power at all of um, yeah, making some difference. So it's so uh, powerful, the political party and the political uh, system, and of course the developers. Yes, well the answer to that for me is that you know, this is not a discussion whether it should be kept or not. I'll generalize, although you probably understand what my position will be, as you imagine. The, the thing is that heritage is a complex matter, and that should be dealt by specialists. If the specialist community in a city says so, the community and the politicians should listen. Um, so th there is an overlap of functions that in this case obviously clearly has broken down, where but there's a community, the architects, the heritage specialists, uh, the conservationists too, who have a role uh, in, in putting their, their thought. But it seems that clearly there something has happened where uh, things can be overruled by, by, by having too much power. When matters are complex and technical, perhaps there should be third parties who do so. And perhaps one of the reasons I wanted to brought this case of the CTBH, because the CTBH, amongst the many working groups, could very well have a, a working group that could lobby the UNESCO to say, let's put the Empire State Building in the, in the World Heritage Register, or let's have guidelines to say, you know, some of these buildings, you know, that, like, for example, I'm, you know, KPF's building in Chicago, I'm, like, I mentioned it, so I don't think it's fair to say some of the work KPF did in the 80s in Chicago, like, as a trip. Triple three Wacker Drive. You know, three 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 Wacker. Yeah. It, it's 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 a piece of history already. Uh, some of Phillips Johnson's work in in New York and everywhere else in, in the United States should be part of the heritage. And so, but this is something that it's up for the specialists, ourselves, architects, and and, and others too. So it's a very yeah relevant problem. <laughs>